Hi, I'm Brian Jones, one of the ministers here at Lancaster First United Methodist Church. I'm so glad you were able to, to worship with us today. You chose to be with us. We'd love to know that you're here. And so you're going to see a QRL code coming up on the screen. Uh, you can use your smartphone and you can connect with us and let us know uh, you're worshiping with us, if you have any questions, prayer requests, or anything like that, because we'd love to know more about you. You can go to our church website and see a lot of information about all the great things that go on at this wonderful, wonderful church. Today, we're going to look at Facing Our Giants. We're going to end our Transformed series, and we're going to look forward to the great things that God has for us. So we hope you enjoy being with us. We hope you worship and God touches your life today, and we hope to hear from you. Have a great day. Good morning. Uh, would you join me in our call to worship? I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. To you, O oh God, we lift our eyes. Have mercy on us. Let's all stand and sing our first hymn, How Firm a Foundation.
Hi, I'm Linda Godenschwager, and I am one of the leaders for the transformation small groups that are meeting through Lent this year. And um, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about my personal thoughts about the study and transformation as well as my small group. Our small group is just that. It's three of us from different faiths and serving one God. Um, we've been friends uh, for many years. Our children went to school together and we've kept a close relationship since then. And God laid it on my heart to host a Bible study in my home when I retired two years ago. So we have been meeting since then. Uh, we had never done one of Rick Warren's studies, but we're all in agreement that it's just been a phenomenal study. The videos, along with Pastor Alice and Brian's sermons, devotions and questions make you think and challenge your faith. Just in case you were wondering or interested in a small group, and just to give you some idea, um, you keep comfortable in your close circle, you develop trust, learn, share, and encourage each other, as well as serve others. It's a great experience and it's also a great way to grow in your faith. As far as participating in the study, um, it really had an impact on our small group with how we view, think, react, in our spiritual life as well as in our everyday life. It's helped us not be so close-minded in our thoughts by looking for a way out, but looking for a way through with Christ's help. And we've experienced a lot of grace, love, and trust through this study. For me personally from the study, uh, I just feel like I'm surrendering things more instead of trying to fix things myself. I'm really bad about that, trying to be in control of everything, just the way I am. But I think the study has really helped me a lot in surrendering more. It's a challenge to understand what uh, some scriptures really mean, but since I've been doing this study, it just feels like things are becoming clearer to me in Scripture even. In closing, I wanted to share something from Sue in our small group who has said several times during our Bible study that she wished she would have started Bible study when she was younger instead of waiting until now. This week, a statement Pastor Brian made in his sermon drew my attention to what Sue had been saying. He said, in our relationship with Christ, someday there'll be an intimacy between you and me. There'll be no need for written law because you'll actually do my desire and follow my will for your life. I think this is Sue's someday. Will you join me in our prayer for the transformed experience? We come before you, God, to, who hears every prayer, admitting that we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed with circumstances of our lives. We are overwhelmed by uncertainty in the world. It seems as if in every corner of our lives, we face our own personal Goliaths. We ask that you transform our spirits of fear into spirits of boldness and assurance. We ask that you give us the courage to be the people of God and hold to the victory you have already won for each of us. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from 1 Samuel uh, verses, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 43 to 47. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Ez Ezekah in Sfm. Uh, Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, 
and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled, defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army to this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Let us be now in an attitude of prayer. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together in this place so different than it was over a year ago. We have come through many trials and tribulations, and still we are blessed within your care. We have reflected upon and prepared for Easter during this Lenten season, and we have played a part in our transformational series. And we find ourselves at the beginning of the end, or is it the end of the beginning? Still, it's not the end of the story, for we are awash in the glow of your transformational power the light of lights reborn in our hearts and in new ways once again. The wonder in, our, in the eyes of our children and our children's children still captivate us as we turn our thoughts both on the past year and its many joys and its many heartbreaks. We pray today that we will always know your peace and seek your forgiveness when we question your faithful presence in our lives. We pray that we may keep the light of Christ's transformational power burning within our hearts well past this Easter season and throughout the remainder of the year. We will rejoice in your good works. We will undertake for your glory. <clears throat> we pray for our families and friends that they may be blessed with fruitful fellowship and the strengthening of the bonds between us, that we may be their comfort in times of challenge and change. We pray for those in our neighborhood, as well as our city and county, that they may find their way to your love, and that we may so order our lives that they be examples of compassion and humility, that these seekers may ask, what makes us so joyful? 
that we may share with them the story of your power to transform us through the life of Christ within us. We pray for those we entrust with public office that they make good and wise decisions regarding their constituents during these troubled but hopeful times. We pray for all peoples who know little of your love, that they may know the warmth and comfort they can receive by the fire of your hospitality, which we will provide. We pray for those that suffer from loss and regrets. We pray for those with no hope or comfort. We pray for those against the wall and desperate. And we pray for those who have chosen to live in the dark of their own lives. May somehow, some way, they all may find the light of Christ. And Lord, we pray our lives are transformed that you answer our prayers today with us. Let us give hope. Let us give comfort to the grieving. Let us work for justice. Let us ensure peace. Let us show grace. Let us be love. Now, let us declare and claim the prayer that you taught your disciples then, the prayer that we teach your disciples today, and the prayer our children's children must teach tomorrow's disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our, <clears throat> excuse me, our New Testament reading today is from the book of James, the first chapter, verses 12 through 18. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we ask the words of my mouth, meditation of our hearts. will be acceptable unto you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. So we asked us uh, last week, we'd had a good time. We were on vacation the, the week before. Uh, and uh, the answer was we did. We had a, a really nice time on vacation. We tried to be smart and uh, try not to cram 800 experiences into a short week and just kind of enjoy our time. We really had a wonderful time. Went down and uh, saw one of my best friends in ministry, went to his church on Sunday and made our way along the Ohio River and stopped some towns we hadn't uh, been in before. Been a few days, Cincinnati. Uh, went down to Kentucky for a few days. While we were in Kentucky, we decided we were close enough. Uh, we went down to where I went to college at Asbury University, just kind of uh, look around. It had been several years we'd been there, and they've been doing a lot of construction. This is uh, uh, the campus above. There's, it looks a little different right now because they're putting in a, a brand new building. It's fun to kind of walk around. And then I was reminded, I wasn't there very long, I was reminded that uh, you know, life is different when you're on a, a Christian campus in the South. Because everybody is friendly. Everybody assumes that, you, that you know, they're going to wave to you and they're going to smile and just have a wonderful time together. And we were walking through the buildings, uh, going to go through the campus bookstore. A young lady, just one of the students there, stopped us and uh, said, have you been over to the communications building? 
And we had, we'd best been there. And so they've got a lot of new exhibits. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that um, Asbury University, uh, for many years, had a great communication department. They have sent students to every single Olympics for about the past probably 30 or 40 years to do videotape, and they have some great memorabilia from that. But if you want the communications building, you'll see that Asbury has been very intentional about seeing uh, the entertainment industry as a mission field, both to the people who work in the industry, who often come from really difficult and broken place in their lives, but also to produce products that could touch other people's lives with good and quality things. And because they've done that, uh, they typically send back real memorabilia, real props that were used in the movies. Or production companies will send them just in, in thanks for all the things they've done. And it's a wide variety, a wide array of things that uh, they have. Uh, things from the Harry Potter movies to uh, the Narnia films to James Bond to uh, Disney movies uh, to a lot of the props that came right out of the last of the Marvel movies and DC movies. Some, some really cool stuff you kind of walk around and look and see. And it's just there for people to to see and go through. It, it's really a lot of fun, but you're also kind of caught up, and John will appreciate this, uh, seeing the stuff they actually use kind of breaks a little bit of a movie uh, magic, if you will, because they're trying to save money, and you go, oh, that was from this movie, and you look at it, and go, that's it's kind of cheap, which it should be, because they're trying to save money. Well, that doesn't look anything like it looked there. One of my favorite pieces, though, and I'll describe it to you the best I can, is up here on the screen. Uh, this is a piece of set that came from uh, the Star Wars Phantom Menace movie. And this is the crowd for the famous pod races. Anakin comes flying around and comes flying through. All it is, though, is a piece of styrofoam that they made to look like a part of a coliseum. And those are Q-tips. And they stick the Q-tips into it and painted each one of those individually. And it doesn't look like much. But when you take a camera and you go by it very quickly, it gives the impression of traveling so fast that the faces are blurred. And so all they had to do then was do that you know, a few times and then by computer just recreate that stadium until it's all the way around the stadium. As you see the people come racing in and racing out. Now you look at it and it's just a bunch of Q-tips in color. But if you watch the movie, it looks like you're traveling so fast you can't distinguish the faces. So I'm caught between losing some of the luster of the movie, but seeing that sometimes you get close to something, that there is some really interesting magic and some really cool things that come from knowing the truth about something. And so I kind of lost, so oh, that's how they did it. But at the same time, I thought, well, that's how they did that. Right. Now, I share that with you this morning to say we're going to take a little bit of luster off of uh, the biblical account that Scott read a few moments ago of David and Goliath. Now, we all know this story. There is not a Sunday school teacher since the beginning of Sunday school worth their salt who hasn't taught the story of David and Goliath at some point. I will guarantee you it is in every children's Bible ever created. You have learned and heard this, depending on when you grew up, if you grew up in church. And we're not going to ask anybody's uh, age this morning, or, or uh, we're not going to rat you out this morning, but some of you learned this as a flannel graph, or a flannel board, or in a Bible story in a book, or a coloring book, children's Bible. Veggie tales doesn't matter. You heard this story. It's easy to see why, right? This wonderful story of, of little cherubic David. Looks like, you know, he kind of came off a precious moment statue, little cherubic face, little curly hair, right? He's about nine or ten, and he's sending up this huge giant. It's a great story. But I suggest that if we draw close to it, we might see that the biblical account and what we have in our minds are two entirely different things. And so I apologize for taking maybe, potentially, some of the luster off of this 
account. Not a story, but an account, because I believe it did happen. But I hope that by seeing perhaps a little better understanding of the biblical account, it might bring some new magic and truth that might be helpful to us. Now, I'm pretty sure they get the biblical account of Goliath correct. I have no problem with that. Right. Huge, nine, ten feet tall, certainly possible. Obviously came over uh, from Greek from the Phoenicians. If you look at how he's dressed, looks very Greek. Right? That, that's, they got that right, I would think. My issue, though, is with David. And the, the idea we have of David might not be quite the accurate account. By the way, I just thought of another biblical account. Well, actually, one of my favorites of David and Goliath. We did several years ago when Scott was our Goliath. And uh, Henry knocked it down during one of our worship services. So we have different views. But in the biblical account, it talks about David being ruddy. And we think ruddy, well, maybe he had kind of, you know, redder cheeks. He's outside all the time, kind of flushed, or had reddish hair. Which, is, again, is certainly possible. But in the ancient Near East, red was the color of masculinity. Like we do gender reveals, you've got blue for boys and pink for girls. They had red and yellow. And so things that were red were more masculine. And so what this, the biblical account is saying is David was a man's man. He wasn't a child, was probably a young man. Remember, they didn't have adolescence back then. You know, being a child, being an adult. Right. David is a man's man, tall, broad-shouldered, and strong. Now, how do we know this? Well, if we draw close again, we know that David says that in, to protect the sheep, he has killed the lion and the bear. Two particularly difficult animals to kill. Bears are notoriously thick skin, thick fur, and thick skull. A child, I don't care how good they are at the sling, able to kill a bear or a lion would be incredibly difficult. So we have to understand and believe that David must have had some size and some strength to him. We know that when he brought the king Saul, that Saul suggests, well, why don't we put my armor on him? Now, we know from earlier accounts in the Bible, Saul's about six foot six. He's very tall. He's eyeballed David and says, this is a guy who could probably fit into my armor. He wouldn't have done that with a small child. Now, granted, David says this doesn't fit. Now, that could mean, you know, I, he wasn't six foot six, so it really didn't work for him. But it could also mean David saying, this really doesn't fit me. I'm not used to wearing armor, and Probably, if I go out and fight a giant, this is not the day to change my tactics. So he says it doesn't fit. But Saul assumed that it might. We know that, and this is a spoiler if you don't know this story. David defeats Goliath, kills him. And it says that he takes Goliath's own sword and cuts off Goliath's head. Again, a really difficult thing to do if you're a 10 or 9 year old child. Everything in the biblical account suggests that David was strong, manly. You know, he's not the 10 year old child. He's the, the guy who has to walk sideways down the hall because his children are scraping, scraping the side. So what I want you to think, we talk about David, is think less Kevin from Home Alone and think a little more Schwarzenegger and Stallone. Because that's kind of the biblical account of what David's like. Now that might really have ruined your understanding of David and Goliath. But I want to suggest that maybe by seeing a closer truth, even if it takes some luster away from the movie magic, it might reveal some really important truth in magic that makes a difference in our lives. We have been talking about being transformed. I am so thankful for all who have been a part of that process. And, and I hope that it really wants to spur you, as, as Linda said in our video, to go deeper and, and not to end your small group experience uh, when this ends. 
I hope it's been really helpful to you. We looked at different ways that God can transform our lives. As we begin to draw this series of studies to a close, as we get ready to enter the Holy Week, we end by looking at how God transforms us as we face our Goliaths, as we face giants in our lives. That's important to us because, you know, it occurred to me that David didn't face just one giant. If you look at David's life, he faces many giants over his lifetime. He faces betrayal. He faces family conflict, conflicts as a king. All throughout David's life, he has to face giants. This is not the end of his facing them just because Goliath has fallen. And how David does that, with an unerring consistency, even though he makes a lot of really horrible mistakes, might give us some principles to face the giants in our lives. You are going to face giants. Being a Christian does not mean that there are not obstacles and giants in your way. We're not talking about how you're so transformed, where your giants are transformed, and you don't have to face them anymore. But it can transform the way that we deal with them. And so you may not have a 10-foot Goliath in your path as you leave here today, but you're going to have giants of some sort. So as we look at this account, one of the principles we can pull out of this to help us learn to face the giants in our life. Well, the first one is this. When you're facing giants, don't believe the lies. Every giant you ever face will try to break you down by lying to you. By telling you that you aren't enough, that you can't be successful, they will whisper words that will demean and destroy your self-worth. They will, at every turn, lie to you and tell you that you cannot be victorious. And this is what David uh, faces, what Goliath does. He lies. Right? He tells the Israelites, you're not where he tells them, I will destroy all of you. Right? Goliath comes out and says, let's just end this. It's too long. My people, your people. Just send me your best person. I'll kill him and we'll, we'll, we'll go home. Right? Because you cannot beat me. One of David's great abilities is to refuse to believe the lies that the giants tell him in his life. So don't believe the lies. Secondly, and this might be the hardest, at some point, you have to step out. I'm convinced that David was not the only person who have defeated Goliath. God wants Goliath defeated. It didn't have to be David. The only really thing that was special about David was he was the only one who decided to step forth and face Goliath. Anybody could have done it. Right? David comes up and he looks and what are we doing? How, this guy's talking smack about our whole country. So we ought to go down and kill him. David is the only one to step out and face the giants. I want to tell you right now, you're going to have giants in your life. They're going to lie to you, but they will not go away unless you face them. I know the easiest thing to do is to put the pillow over your head. I know the easiest thing to do is to get back with the rest of the crowd and cower and hide because there's safety in numbers. But the only way for you to defeat the giants in your life is you have to step out and you have to face them. You have to have courage. Now, I want to say something about courage, because I think we get this messed up a lot. Courage is not the absence of fear. Being afraid does not mean that you're not a courageous person. And very often, we will refuse to step out and face our giants because we wait until we're not going to be afraid anymore. 
Courage has nothing to do with being afraid. Some of the most courageous people in the world are, the, are people who are incredibly afraid of their situations. Courage is not an absence of fear. Courage is when you're willing to step out even when you are afraid. That's courage. At some point, whether you like it or not, you have to step out and face them. But it's going to be okay. Because God has given you the experiences to face your giants. Your experiences matter. What does David say when he comes out against God? They say, well, you can't defeat this guy. And David said, well, I killed lions and bears. I could probably take this guy. David realized all the things that he has experienced as a shepherd. If you think about all of them, caring for the sheep, the time alone with God, and this kind of poetic nature rises up in David. The time he's had to be afraid and fight bears and lions. All of David's experiences gave him what he needed to defeat the giants in his life. And that's true for you as well. All of us have experiences in our life that we wonder why God allows us to go through them. I've had a few of those just the past couple of weeks. I wonder, God, why, why did we go through that? I, just don't, I don't see an end game. I don't see why that happened. God never lets us or wants us to waste an experience. Every experience you've ever had will give you what you need in order to face the giants in your life. You are enough. You have enough to face them. So maybe you're going through some things right now and you're saying, I have no idea why God's let me go through this. Well, it might be because at some other point you have to face a giant. And it might not even be your giant, giant because sometimes God raises us up to face and protect someone else. It might not be about you at all. And the hardest lesson we have to learn in life is life is not always about us. I hate that. I love life to be all about me. I'll be honest with you about that. I love that, but it's not. And we're all better off for it, obviously. Every experience you've had will give you the abilities to face the giants in your life, both your good and your bad experiences. So embrace them. You have enough resources. This is my favorite one. I don't know why, but it, it, every time I, I, I talk about this, I, I guess I have a favorite thing. This is my favorite one today. David goes down and he gets five smooth stones from the river. Now, by the way, um, I've seen uh, archaeological digs where they pulled up uh, sling stones. They are not little rocks. They're about the size of your fist. They're heavy. You look, and you go, yeah, I can see where that could just take somebody completely, completely out. But David goes down and God gives him five. Now, how many did David need? One. Now, you might make the case, well, David's just making sure he's got enough ammo in case he misses the first time, and that's probably true. But isn't it also an understanding of God's abundance? That when, when we rely on God's resources, he gives us more than we need. You have more than you need. God's resources are limitless. Do not be afraid when you have to face the giants in your life. You have more than enough resources because God always gives in abundance. And finally, David was able to face the giants because he knew this wasn't his battle. It, it just wasn't his battle. Right? You know how this story goes. David comes down. Goliath starts laughing. That they send someone like David, no armor, no shield, no sword. And he said to Goliath, says, are you just going to waste my time? And David says, you come against me with sword and spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. David realized in the end, the battle is always God's. Maybe David's greatest ability to face the giants was he's able to see beyond how big 
his foe was and see how big a God he served. I want you to know that. I want you to know if you have giants in your life, it could be health issues, it could be a relationship issue, it could be a job, it could be this crazy year we just begin to get through. That it's never been your battle. It's always belonged to God. Now, does that mean that you're never going to have any defeats in life? Well, no, you will. But I've learned something about my defeats in life. And maybe this is true for you. I can only speak from my own experience, but here's what I've learned. I'm not really good at being able to determine what's a victory or what's a defeat in my life. Because sometimes I think it's a victory just because things went the way that I wanted them to. And realize it really wasn't a victory at all and God's got to do a lot of patching up of things. And sometimes I go through things I think are defeats because I made the judgment too quickly and God's working out a, a great victory. Maybe not for me. Maybe for somebody else. So I've learned in all honesty that I'm not the best person to determine what's victorious and what's a defeat in my life. And I look back and I realize God has been much more victorious over everything in my life that I face. So it doesn't mean you won't have momentary moments of defeat, but you will have victory. So I wish I could say your giants are going to be gone when you walk out of this building, but I can't. I can tell you don't believe the lies. I can tell you sometimes you've got to step out. I can tell you that your experiences matter. I can tell you that God has an abundance of resources you've never imagined and will not leave you high and dry. I can tell you who, that the battle belongs to the one who is victorious over all things. So be transformed. Face your, face your giants. And may God lead us in all blessing. Amen. Would you pray with me? Loving God as always, God, we bring our gifts before you this day. Sometimes God being faithful in the midst of a year like we're going through is a, is a big giant. And this church has been incredibly faithful. Bless all the gifts that we bring that you might be honored by them, that you might be, God, glorified in them. We might live our lives in ways that honor and glorify you. Amen. Join together in our closing hymn. When the is my glory will my way, when sorrows like sea
you've seen the benediction, may you go from this place and may it be well with your soul. May you face your giants and emerge victorious and go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.